In this lecture, we're going to learn about the interplay between mass transfer and catalysis. And this is a pretty important topic in practice because an industrial heterogeneous catalyst is prepared by dispersing the actual catalytic material. Those could be little tiny nanoparticles. They could be some precursor grafted onto the surface of the catalyst. They're much, much smaller than the actual catalytic particles. So we usually think of these catalytic particles as some large porous support material, uh, a little sphere, for example, of, of a porous material, and then that sphere is impregnated with the catalytic material that goes down into the pores, and the actual reaction has to, has to happen down in those pores, so you have uh, your molecules in the gas phase are coming in, they reach this, the surface of the particle, they have to diffuse through the porous material, the reaction happens somewhere down in here, and then they, be, then they are converted into the product, which I'll write down as B here, and then they, they sort of diffuse back out the other direction through the pore network. So this is the conceptual idea. What we're going to learn is the sort of qualitative features of the way this works and the way it can affect the apparent rate of catalysis. So we write down our, our microkinetic models and describe the turnover frequency and all those things, and, and those are functions of the concentration. But it is important to remember that when we talk about those models, we're talking about the concentration right in the local vicinity of the active site. That might be, because of mass transfer limitations, it might be very different from the concentration of reactants out here in the interstitial space. And we're learning this a little bit out of order for the typical course because I want you to be able to formulate models for reactor scale problems uh, in the next unit and practice using these skills all together. So what we're going to do in this section is we're going to learn about Thiele moduli and we're going to learn about effectiveness factors. And we're going to do these calculations for a spherical geometry, that is for a spherical shaped pellet. Uh, but we will also be able to extend these ideas to other shapes. And then we will, we will not go through and include the effects of heat transfer. Okay? We just aren't going to have time to do it in the class this year. What we're going to do is start our analysis from the species balance equation. Uh, just to recap, this is a accumulation term right here. Uh, we have a convection term right here. We have a diffusion term right here. And we have a reaction term right here. A generation of A molecules per unit volume inside the catalyst pore network. The assumptions that we're going to make here are that we're at steady state, so that's going to get rid of our accumulation term. We're going to assume that we have no convection within the pellet. That's going to get rid of the convection term here. Uh, we're going to simplify the description of the kinetics to say that it's just first order in the concentration of A. So it's important to remember that that means that there's a lot lumped in here. Okay? Uh, and by that I mean you would go through and derive the turnover frequency and figure out what the rate expression is. And hopefully we're looking at a range of concentrations where our rate law is first order in concentration of A. And then we lump all the things that come before that concentration factor into this K. So this is pretty complicated, and of course, uh, it's going to, for one thing, depend on the density of catalytic sites per volume inside this porous pellet, okay? So that's one of the things that's going to be lumped in there, but there could be a lot more, okay? So the solution to one of those complicated microkinetic models in general. And then the last thing that we're going to assume is that, so, so now we know how to deal with, with this. The last thing that we're going to assume is that we have a spherical geometry and that there are no angular gradients. No need to think about either of these two angles and spherical coordinates. Our species balance equation becomes zero is equal to our diffusivity. And this one also, I have to say a few things. A lot is lumped in. Okay, so this species balance, uh, this diffusivity is an effective diffusivity. I should really write that, okay? So that's an effective diffusivity through the pore network. Now you probably remember from your 422 class, we can estimate the diffusivity in a porous material by using the diffusivity in the, in the gas that occupies the pores, or maybe in the liquid that occupies the pores, and multiplying by the void fraction and dividing by the path length through the pores, the tortuosity, people often call this. Uh, so this is just a little little reminder of some of your mass transfer material. Uh, all right, so this is my effective diffusivity. We have 1 over r squared d dr of r squared dca dr, right? So this, this whole operator that you see here, the 1 over r squared, that's just this thing when you have a spherically symmetric problem. 
All right, so really all we have here is the diffusivity multiplied by the Laplacian of the concentration minus this KCA. So the KCA, of course, is this assumption here in practice. Okay, so we're consuming reactant A, so the plus here became a negative sign. I, I should have been a little bit more careful with that, obviously. Okay, so this is minus RA. Shame on me. A couple little caveats here. We have to have either a carrier gas or countercurrent diffusion. So I have described the situation as though we're making molecule A, or sorry, we're consuming molecule A, and then it, it converts to a single molecule B and diffuses back out. So in this case, countercurrent diffusion down inside that pore network is a really good assumption. The other circumstance where it can be okay is if you have a large amount of some inert carrier gas. All right, so we're not gonna say much more about those things here. I want you guys to learn the sort of qualitative nature of these effects and, and not worry about an absolutely detailed calculation to correct for everything. Our species balance equation now has become a standard second order ODE. We're gonna need two boundary conditions in order to solve that. One of them is that the concentration of A at the surface is going to be given by uh, we also have a boundary condition that says the concentration in the center of the pellet is bounded. That's not a formal boundary at the center of the pellet, but the divergence theorem allows us to go from saying that this concentration in the interior of the pellet is bounded, take the limit as the region that we're considering gets closer and closer to the center of the pellet, and because whatever is generated at steady state must be coming out, we can relate that to the, to the flux at that location R0, which is getting closer and closer to zero. And you see that this has to tend towards zero, and so that derivative has to also tend towards zero. Okay, so you can actually derive a relationship. When people talk about condition being bounded at the center, you can actually show that that does imply another condition that the, the derivative of the concentration with respect to R goes to zero in the middle. So now what we're gonna do is to non-dimensionalize these equations. We're gonna use R over bar and equate it to the, the actual radius R divided by the radius of my pellet. We're also gonna non-dimensionalize the concentration here. So that's gonna be the concentration of A divided by the surface concentration. After changing variables, we find a single dimensionless parameter called the Thiele modulus. This is the form of the new equation. Instead of having a rate constant here and a diffusivity here, we just have a single thing called the squared Thiele modulus here. So the squared Thiele modulus, if you go back and reverse engineer where that equation came from, is gonna have a definition K times R squared over D. Okay, so you notice that this lumped in all the geometry effects, all of the intrinsic kinetics, and my effective diffusivity all lumped together into one dimensionless parameter. My boundary conditions become that the concentration at location one, dimensionless radius one, is equal to one, and my derivative in the, in the center of my palette is going to zero. Now, if we look back at our ODE, we have a singular point here at r equals zero. We have to end up using the Frobenius method. This may be something you learned in a differential equations class in undergrad. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, the point is that you don't have to just guess these solutions. There is a systematic way of going about getting them called Frobenius series, and in this case, it gives you that you should be able to obtain a solution from the substitution that C related to a, a new function Y through a variable transformation or reweighting of R to the sigma, where sigma is equal to negative one. So we're gonna make that substitution uh, that C is equal to one over R times Y. That should simplify our equation. Indeed it does. If you put this into the equation for C and go through and carry out all the, all the derivatives, you find that a lot of things cancel and you end up with this simplified equation for y. Now y is a, a simple differential equation, constant coefficients. In this case, the signs give you uh, exponential functions. It's more convenient to write those as sine hyperbolic and cosine hyperbolic. You get that y is equal to a cosine hyperbolic of phi plus b sine hyperbolic of phi times r. Matching boundary conditions now at r equals zero, the cosine hyperbolic part is going to give me an unbounded solution and I have to get rid of that, okay? So we have to get rid of this term and that means we need to make A zero. The sine hyperbolic part is going to zero and R is going to zero and this one looks like a linear function of R and the limit is R goes to zero. So, so that one is well behaved at the origin. The other boundary condition at R equals one, coefficient B is gonna be one over sine hyperbolic of phi and now that has pinned down our final solution. So A is equal to sine hyperbolic of phi R 
over r times sine hyperbolic of phi. And we can plot this on a scale from 0 to, to 1, being the dimensionless radius of the, of the whole sphere. Remember, this is my radius of my pellet. So this is distance from center of the pellet moving outward with the center right here at 0. And the vertical axis here is my dimensionless concentration. Okay, So when I'm at a very small value of the Thiele modulus, we have uh, diffusion into the pellet is, is much faster than the reaction in the pellet. And we don't really get much of a dead zone in the center, right? So the A molecules out here, they reach the edge of the pellet, they penetrate into the inside, they diffuse through the pore network very quickly, and they go all the way to the interior before they get consumed. The interior concentration as a result of that is almost the same as the outside skin concentration. In contrast, when you have a very big Thiele modulus, it's telling you, if you look back at its definition, it's telling you that diffusion is very slow compared to the reaction. And so what happens then is that the reactants come, they reach the surface of the pellet, they diffuse just a little way inside, and most of them are converted into B. And so no A is reaching the center of the pellet. You have this big dead zone in the middle. No A molecules can actually penetrate they've been consumed out there at the skin. This might seem like a great situation. My catalyst must be so fast. Well, yes, but you have impregnated the entire catalyst with active sites that never see the reactant. And so if their catalyst is expensive, as they often are, you are really not performing as well as you could be by just using smaller catalyst particles. Usually what you can do is just use smaller pellets, and then all of the catalyst uh, sites see the, the bulk concentration of the, of the reactants. It's very convenient to reformulate all of this and effectively come up with a way of absorbing the solutions to these partial differential equations into an effective kinetics. And so this analysis here, Thiele and Zeldovich back in, back in the early 1940s. Okay, so what we're going to do now is follow Thiele and we're going to define something called an effectiveness factor. The effectiveness factor is defined as the actual rate averaged over the entire volume of the catalyst pellet, divided by the rate assuming that the surface conditions prevail throughout the pellet. So what does that look like for our problem? We have a spherical catalyst pellet. We're going to integrate the rate constant multiplied by the concentration. Uh, we have a Jacobian factor to integrate over the entire volume of the catalyst pellet. Now, what would be the rate, the corresponding quantity, if the surface conditions in the pellet prevailed throughout the whole interior? Well, I know the volume of the catalyst pellet is 4 pi over 3 times the radius cubed, so that's this piece, and I just multiply by the concentration at the skin of the pellet and my rate constant. And that now gives me the rate, assuming that my surface conditions prevail throughout. You can go back and use the function of r, that use those hyperbolic functions, to actually complete these integrals, and we won't do that here. The answer is that this is that ratio, okay? So this is my effectiveness factor. And what you see is that when mass transfer limitations are, are negligible, the effectiveness factor is 1. It means that your catalyst is operating at full speed with no, no encumbrance from these mass transfer limitations. Now, when your Thiele modulus becomes very large, it's telling you that, that transport limitations, mass transfer limitations in particular, are becoming important, and that's going to start to hinder the ability of your catalyst to do its job. Other geometry, so, so let's imagine that we have a slab of thickness L. This is our catalyst particles. It can even be a powder, a layer of catalyst, and you have to diffuse through the interstitial spaces in the powder, for example. At the surface of this layer, we have a fixed concentration C sub S, again, and at the bottom of this catalyst layer, we have that the gradient of the concentration with respect to depth into the catalyst layer is going to go to zero. So if we redo all the math, we find that non-dimensionalizing our species balance equation with these choices gives us a Thiele modulus of KL squared over D, and that the effectiveness fact ends up being tangent hyperbolic of phi divided by phi. If we redid this for a cylinder, the math is a little bit harder. K r squared over d, same Thiele modulus, and the effectiveness factor that you get is 3 times i1 of phi over phi times i0 of phi. And this one asymptotically follows 2 over phi. Eta plotted on a log scale versus phi on a log scale looks like this. You have the spherical result 3 over phi, you have the cylindrical result, which is going to 2 over phi, and you have the slab result, which is going to 1 over phi, and they all, at very small values of phi, approach 1. Okay, So you can anticipate about where these things cross over. 
uh, as the intersection with one for each case, and for the slab, for the cylinder, and for the sphere.